So again, welcome everyone. I'm so happy to have you here tonight and just want to introduce our speaker. Kent Walters is a biologist and amateur naturalist. Kent entered his PhD in ecolo ecological physiology at the University of Notre Dame, where he studied the abilities of a few species of beetles to, to survive harsh Alaskan winters. While still working on his PhD in 2008, Kent sparked his passion for native plants when he began contemplating the future of two acres of former pasture in his homestead in Warren County, Indiana. Very methodical in his approach, he began by reading all 450 plus pages of the Tall Grass Restoration Handbook from cover to cover twice. Every year, his, this passion has grown. Last year, the restorations grew to include over 25 acres of former pasture and much of the landscaping around the house. In one particularly frantic year, Kent single-handedly started over 4,000 plugs in his greenhouse for use in landscaping near the driveway. Last year, Kent was selected to spearhead the prairie restoration at Secret Park in Warren County, Indiana. Kent now stays home full-time and homeschools his three boys in whom he tries to instill a hard work ethic and a love of nature. So with that, Kent, take it away. All right, thank you, Julie. Thank you for that introduction. And I would like to thank Niches as well for inviting me to give this talk because it is something that I'm very passionate about. I really care about native plants and I think it's a great opportunity to share some of the things I've learned about landscaping with native plant communities. So before I can start talking about landscaping with native plant communities, I should probably define define what a native plant community is. There we go. So. So I'm still seeing the first slide. Okay, it's there showing we, me the second slide. There, there we go. It's it's popped up for me too now. Thanks. <laughs> like there's a little bit of a delay, but we'll just roll with it. So. <laughs> A native, a plant community is all the plants that share an environment and interact with one another. So a plant community is determined by the local climate and the conditions on the ground. So the soil, the topography, the history of disturbance in the area and the aspect. And I'm going to circle back around to some of these terms to define them and talk a little bit more about them. So soil obviously plays an important role. So if you have sandy soil versus a silty soil or a loamy soil, well, those are gonna hold on to nutrients differently, the water's gonna flow through them differently and they will support different plant communities. Also, the pH of the soil can have a big impact on the kinds of plants that grow there. So some plants like acidic soil, whereas others prefer alkaline conditions and most plants are somewhere in the middle preferring slightly acidic conditions. The depth of the soil is also important. So if you have a relatively thin soil, that means it's not able to hold on to much moisture because that, that subsoil can really store moisture through drought conditions. And so if you have thin soil, it's a relatively droughty soil and that will affect the plant community that's able to survive there. So the topography, whether there's hills or whether it's flat. So if, if you have hills, you have a natural moisture gradient. So the top of the hill is always going to be drier than the bottom of the hill because as it rains, the water percolates through the soil and moves down the hill. So it'll set up a natural moisture gradient from driest on top to moistest at the bottom. And this will in turn favor slightly different plant communities as you move from the top of the hill down to the bottom of the hill. Um, I just wanted to talk a, couple, a little bit about a couple of terms that are used here. So dry mesic, mesic just means medium soils. So dry is self-explanatory. Dry mesic's in between dry and medium. And then wet mesic and wet. So wet music conditions, you may observe in your own yard. So if you have a place that puddles in your lawn, that would be wet music. So they often have an excess of moisture in the spring, but they dry out in the summer. And wet places, the groundwater or the water table is very close to the soil, surface of the soil, 
So they never dry out unless you have a particularly droughty year. So another term that I talked about that can have a big impact on the community in a particular location is that aspect. So this is the compass direction that a slope faces. So south facing slopes get direct sun throughout the year and they tend to be the hottest and driest. Whereas north facing slopes rare, essentially don't ever get direct sunlight. So they tend to be cool and moist. West and east facing slopes are somewhat intermediate. So west facing slopes are moister than south facing slopes, but drier than east facing slopes. And the reason is because they get evening sun and the evening sun's relatively hot and the conditions are relatively dry then when you compare them to say east facing slopes, which get morning sun, which is relatively less harsh. So those set up different conditions on different sides of a hill. And sometimes you can have dramatically different communities growing on one side of the hill versus another. So another factor that determines the plant community that grows in a particular area is the history of disturbance. So have there been recent fires that have gone through? Was there a storm that came through and knocked down the trees? Is there a buffalo wa wallow or have groundhogs been digging? So these are all examples of disturbance in an area. So when the pioneers or colonists first arrived to this part of the country, they would have observed a fire dependent landscape. So they would have seen a mosaic of prairie, savanna, and woodland in this area. And the reason they saw that is because this landscape was heavily managed by Native Americans who used fire to control regrowth of the landscape, to move game, to attract game, to new regrowth in areas. And so Native Americans used fire for tens, well, about, you know, thousands of years in this area since the last glaciation to manage the landscape. And actually through their actions, they promoted the existence of biodiversity. So we should never think that humans are incompatible with biodiversity because we can actually foster it through our actions. So I'm gonna talk about these broad categories of plant communities. So prairie is the most open. It's dominated by grasses, forbs, which are, it's just another word for wildflowers and a few shrubs like lead plant and New Jersey tea. But there are essentially no trees or very, very few trees. So savanna, there are more trees, but the trees are open grown and there's lots of light that floods down to the understory. So the understory, the herbaceous layer at the ground level is the dominant part of this landscape. And you have lots of grasses and wildflowers that grow there and some open grown oaks scattered around. As the number of trees increase, you move into woodland. So woodlands are dominated by the trees. So oaks and hickories are the dominant trees, but you still have a good grassy turf with a lot of wildflowers that bloom from the spring through the summer and into the fall. So as we move out of fire dependent landscapes, we get into forest. So forest has canopy trees that are relatively shade tolerant like maples and beeches. And it's also characterized by having understory trees like blue beech and ironwood. And you notice that when you look down at the herbaceous layer, you look at the ground in midsummer, it's just leaf litter. There's hardly any plants there. So this forest, while it may have a rich display of flowers in the spring, by midsummer, it's not good habitat for most pollinators. So these other fire dependent systems tend to support pollinators throughout the year because they have flowers blooming from early spring into fall. So in a plant community, all the plants are competing with one another. They find ways to share resources such as light, water, soil, even pollinators and wind can be re are resources that can be shared by plants. So plants tend to find a niche that limits direct competition with other plant species. So if we look at the, the roots of these prairie species, 
you'll notice that some are relatively short and fibrous, and these roots focus on taking water and nutrients from the upper levels of the soil, whereas you have some roots that are very long and go down deep, maybe even 15 foot down into the subsoil. And that allows them to take water and nutrients from deep within the layers of soil. And that helps to reduce the competition that would occur otherwise between the different plant species. Another way that plants can share resources is by the timing of their life cycle. So certain plants will go, grow early in the season. So this is a picture of my prairie in early spring, midsummer, and then in autumn. So in, in early spring, you notice we have some wild hyacinths. These are shooting stars, some golden alexanders, not a whole lot going on, but these, the wild hyacinths and shooting stars are spring ephemerals. So they actually grow up very early in the spring and complete their life cycle and die back by midsummer. And in this way, they can avoid competition with taller, more aggressive species that grow later in the summer. And likewise, when you get over here into the fall, many of the grasses have started to senesce and die back. And likewise, many of the summer blooming plants have started to die back. So, it allows more light to reach the ground this time of year. And there are certain species that are able to take advantage of that for fall blooming. So for instance, some asters, goldenrods, and gentians all take advantage of the extra light that's available this time of year to power their blooming. So in that way, they're able to reduce direct competition, both for light and for pollinators, because pollinators are a resource that the plants need. And if they're all blooming at the same time, there's not enough pollinators to go around. So I'm gonna talk about some of the properties of plant communities. So diverse plant communities are resilient. And resiliency just means that they have a great ability to recover from a disturbance. And the reason, part of the reason why these plant communities are resilient is because there's redundancy. So redundancy means that you have basically two plants that are occupying essentially a very similar niche within that plant community. So for instance, in my prairie, I have golden alexanders and prairie parsnips. And they both are relatively early blooming. They have short flowers. They're both in the carrot family. The, their flowers are accessible to short tongued bees and to wasps. And so if you lose one of these species, and I misspoke, it's prairie parsley and golden alexander. So those are the two species I was referring to. But if you lose one of them, then it doesn't have a big impact on the system because you have the other one that's still there to provide its services. And so in this way, diverse communities make healthy ecosystems. So native plant communities support a healthy ecosystem and I'm gonna tell you why. So, we know that functioning ecosystems provide benefits to us humans and to other life. We call these ecosystem services. So some of the services that they provide for us are clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, they retain and build soil, they keep nutrients in place, and they help to promote a stable climate. And it turns out that native plant communities are better at providing these ecosystem services than other types of land cover, like lawn grass, row crops, pasture, or residential neighborhood. And if you look at this diagram down below, you, you may see part of the reason for that. So these are prairie roots, which go down deep and do a very good jo job of holding the soil in place. Right over here at this very far left-hand side of the diagram, you see lawn grass. So this is lawn grass, turf grass from your lawn. And you see that the inches, the roots go just mere inches down. So when you compare 
natives to lawn grass. The natives are much better at holding the soil in place and building topsoil. They're better at promoting infiltration into the water because their roots, they structure the, the soil in such a way that the water can go down easily into the soil by their interactions with their roots. They reduce soil erosion, they reduce nutrient runoff, and all these prairie roots, they occasionally die down there. And when they die, they leave carbon behind down in the soil. And that helps to store carbon long term and helps to have you know, a moderating impact on global warming. So why plant native plant communities? Because they, they support local wildlife. So native insects have evolved to use native plants as a food source. And if you plant non-native landscaping around your house, you basically have a food desert. It's, it's been determined in scientific studies that native plants support about 15 times as much insect life as non-native plants. And many moths and butterflies rely on just a few native plant species for food as larvae. So if you lose these plant species from the landscape, then you will no longer have those species of moths and butterflies. And though the main source of many of the birds that we love seeing in our backyard when they're rearing their young are caterpillars. So if we lose diversity in plants, then we lose diversity in food for, for our wildlife. Insects, in, as a matter of course, represent the main mechanism by which plant material is turned into animal protein. So that's where most of the herbivory occurs. If, if, and then vertebrates rely on insects for food, including the vast majority of the songbirds. If you plant non-native plants in your yard, so I think this was in Maryland. They discovered that the nesting success of Carolina chickadees was faltered when the percentage of native plants in residential neighborhoods dropped below 70%. In essence, by not having native plants in the landscape, they were starving the birds. They couldn't get their preferred, preferred food source, which was caterpillars, because they just weren't available because they were not living on the non-native plants. And so one of the native plants that deserves a special shout out are oak trees. So plant one if you have room because they're really excellent for wildlife. They support more species of caterpillars than any, any other plant by far. And they support the life cycles of many other animals, including lichens and mosses that grow on the trunks and in the branches of the trees, vascular plants that will tap into the roots of the oaks, fungi that live, live within symbiotic relations with the trees, insects that feed on the trees, and birds and mammals that feed on those insects. So oak trees are really a great plant for wildlife. Yet another reason to plant native plant communities is that native plant communities support pollinators throughout the growing season. So for instance, in prairies, there's blooms from about mid-April. So we have common blue violets, shooting stars, wild hyacinths, cream wild indigo, and you know, and other, other species. And they continue to bloom through late October, early November, sometimes even longer. So with gentians, goldenrods, and asters. And in the summer, there's a little profusion of flowering plants that are available for pollinators. So open woodlands and savannas, the fire maintained communities, also have a complete blooming phenology. So that just means they have flowers blooming from early spring till late fall. So the entire growing season, there's food available for pollinators. As I mentioned in dense forests, that's not the case. And the problem with that is that if we withhold fire from our landscape, succession will eventually take it to forest. That's what it wants to become because we have adequate moisture available. So without the disturbance of fire, all of our prairies, savannas, and woodlands will become a relatively 
poor forest that doesn't sustain as many species. And many pollinator species are specialists. They're mostly specialist bees, and they only use, utilize the floral resources of one or a few plant species. So if you take these plant species out of the landscape, then their po pollinators can no longer exist. So I think a pretty compelling reason to plant native plant communities is that native plant communities are adapted to the local environment. They're adapted to the extremes of our climate and they're not going to experience freeze damage or other climate related injury. They don't have any need for fertilizers and they're adapted to our local soils. And they're low maintenance and they're dynamic meaning they're changing, they change through the season. I liken it to a living tapestry. So if you look here, this is spring and having an increasing number of shooting stars. So I expect next year to have many fold more than I have this year. It's just where I'm at in the successional arc of things. And you can see that by midsummer, it looks completely different. There's a profusion of wild bergamot and gray-headed coneflower, compass plant, prairie dock, just a whole different suite of species blooming. And then by fall, I, I feel like this sort of looks like a Monet painting, but it's just beautiful with the purple New England asters and the golden rods and gentians, which you can't really see, but there are a few in there. And the thing is that you're able to achieve this without needing to pull up the tulips and plant annuals to replace them so you get a succession of blooms. It just happens naturally. Nature does it for you. So I think that's part of the beauty of native plant communities. As a gardener, I really appreciate the fact that native plant communities are fairly impervious to common weeds. So things like dandelion, and crabgrass and foxtail grass, you can chuck a handful of seeds in there and they, they can't grow, they're not able to compete. So this essentially means no more weeding. Of course, there are some caveats. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't happen overnight. So if you start a prairie planting, it may require multiple years for the planting to exclude most weeds. And some certain aggressive weedy natives, it can take up to 20 years before they're completely suppressed from the planting. So for instance, the tall goldenrod that's so aggressive and spreads clonally, it will eventually be shut out of the prairie community, but it takes a good number of years for that sod to build up, for those root connections to just form a dense turf. And so more diverse communities are less susceptible to weedy or invasive species. In the early years, the plantings are highly susceptible to invasion and domination by aggressive native species like big blue stem, Indian grass, tall or Canada goldenrod. And so you need to be careful of these in the early years and may need to do some management to take care of them. Certain invasive species, which are weedy, like white sweet, sweet clover and Canadian thistle, can invade even high quality prairie remnants. So you always have to be vigilant for these because it's much easier to control a small population that's just starting than to try to control one that's already spread throughout your planting. And the final reason that I'm going to give for planting native plant communities is that they're beautiful. I think they're just wonderful to look at. I enjoy walking through my plantings. So this is right next to my driveway and I just stand there and watch the bees and the wasps and the flies and everything buzz around and pollinate the flowers. This is down by my pond. You can see some antrus and rattlesnake master. And then this is the main prairie that is between the house and the pond and that shows the shooting stars that are blooming in the spring. And I couldn't stop with just those first few pictures, so I thought I would include some more. 
This is the main prairie in between the house and the pond, and we have some green wild indigo blooming and Oh no, I think- And then this is sort of a shadier section right next to our lane by the house. And these are many of the spring wildflowers. So there, there are some shooting stars, wild geraniums, and some columbine, wild columbine. So with all of these reasons, I think they're pretty compelling to use native plants to garden with but there are even i think your help when you plant native plant communities you can make a difference you're helping to support our natural ecosystems that are very much beleaguered by pesticides and herbicides and by habitat degradation and development and farming and all of these things chip, chip, chip away at the natural community and the services it provides to us. And your actions by planting a native pollinator garden or a native plant community may seem small, but the collective actions of many individuals can make a huge difference. By planting a native plant community, you will support a healthy ecosystem for some of the reasons we talked about earlier. You'll provide food and habitat for local wildlife, You'll provide food and habitat for pollinators throughout the growing season, and you'll create a beautiful dynamic landscape and reduce the amount of time, maintenance, and chemical inputs required to maintain it. So I hope I sold you on why to garden with native plant communities. Now I'm going to move on and transition to the how to garden with plant, native plant communities. So the first step is getting to know your site. So you remember those factors we talked about that influence native plant communities like soil, slope, aspect, and topography. So those are all really important to determining which native plant community is appropriate for your site. So you need to know what kind of soil you have. It's good to know the pH. Obviously, you can tell whether you have any hills or not. And you can tell by the, the compass direction that the slope faces, the aspect of that slope, so whether it faces to the north or the south. Obviously, shading from any trees will have a profound impact on the community that grows there. So if you have trees in your landscape and you have a small planting, you're not going to want prairie species. You're going to want things that are more shade tolerant, like savanna species or woodland species. And bear in mind that even small differences in topography represent opportunities. So if you notice that you have a place in your lawn where water puddles in the spring, well, that represents an opportunity to plant wet music plants in that location. And likewise, if you have a small knoll or an area in your lawn that drains excessively and the, brown, the grass always turns brown there first when it gets dry in the summer, well, that's a good place to plant dry music species. So even tiny differences in your lawn can make big differences in the plant community that you put there. So once you know your site, you should try to get to know your site's target community. So what, what community should grow in that location? So I would recommend researching native plants in their community. So Illinois Wildflowers is a website and it has extensive knowledge on all kinds of woodland plants, savanna plants, prairie plants, wetland plants, and it talks about the conditions that they grow under, the communities that they grow in, the pollinators that they interact with. It, it just, it's almost overwhelming because the information is so voluminous, but it has nice pictures there, and I've found it quite useful. Another book that I like is The Wild Flowers and Ferns of Indiana Forest by Michael Hamoya. So it really is plant community focused. So it talks about the plant communities that exist in different woodland settings. And of course, that tall grass restoration handbook for prairie savannas and woodlands that I read through cover to cover twice. It's really good. It talks about plant communities and it also gives you more information. It delves into all aspects of prairie, savannas, and woodlands. 
and how to restore them. I highly recommend visiting high quality natural areas. For me, it just makes me feel better for one thing. And Niche's properties represent an excellent opportunity to, to view intact plant communities. So they're good examples of high quality woodlands. They're also high quality savannas. In addition, there are some prairie remnants that are located within a two hour drive of where I live here in Warren County. And they all happen to be cemetery prairie remnants because that's the only part of the landscape we decided to set aside for prairie was in cemeteries. So there's the Loda Cemetery Prairie Preserve, the Prospect Cemetery Prairie, and the Paxton Cemetery Prairie. And those are all located in East Central Illinois within an hour, hour and a half of where I live. And then there's a, a remnant prairie up in Northwest Indiana. It's the German Methodist Cemetery Prairie. And when I visited my first prairie remnants, I was awed by the beauty and the complexity and how different it was from what I would what I had expected because I was only familiar with prairie restorations, but prairie remnants are a much different beast. They're much shorter in stature and there's a lot more complexity in the plants that grow there. So if you're interested, I would highly recommend you to visit one or more of these places. So when you're thinking about your project, one thing to bear in mind is that projects may be eligible for subsidies from the federal government. So Grasslands for Game Birds and Songbirds is a program that's jointly administered by the Indiana DNR and the NRCS, so the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And it's sort of geared towards small landovers, landowners, private individuals, and they'll work with parcels, I think, as small as an acre, maybe even smaller than that, to help you plant a native planning, to establish a native community. And they will provide both expertise and financial help for you to do that. In where I live in Warren County, if you're located above State Road, north of State Road 28, then you're eligible for that program. Another possibility is EQIP funding, which stands for Environmental Quality Incentive Program through the NRCS. And if you're interested, say you have a bean field or a pasture that's a larger tract of land that you would like to convert to prairie, well, the NRCS can help you with that. So I would encourage you to follow that up. So getting down to the nitty gritty, We've done our planning. We know what our site is. We know what our target community is. We need to prepare our site. So for sunny sites, it's best, off, best to kill off the existing herbaceous layer, so the ground level vegetation. Probably the easiest way to do this is with herbicides. I don't like herbicides, but they are a useful tool. And two treatments will do the trick. Usually one in June before your cool season grasses get too stressed and before the warm season grasses that are annuals like crabgrass and foxtail grass start producing seed, you want to kill it off. And then you'll do a follow up in September to get anything that re-sprouts from that first treatment. Another option if you're really opposed to herbicides is the use of solarization. So solarization, you apply a sheet of plastic over the ground and it acts like a mini greenhouse. So it accumulates heat from the sun's rays which pass through, then the heat can't escape and that kills off the vegetation below. But if you have any shade over the area that you're trying to treat, it's not very effective. Any shade will spare the vegetation underneath. And this requires multiple iterations through the summer. So you need to do the solarization and then let it re-sprout and then do the solarization and then let it re-sprout and do that a third time. And that usually will be pretty effective. On a smaller scale, you could use cardboard and just mulch over the top of it. This is appropriate for plugs, so little plants that you get in pots, but not seeds. 
because you don't wanna spread your seeds on top of mulch. So if you have a woodland site or a shadier site, you can simply just burn off the leaf litter in the fall and broadcast your seeds and they'll, with frost and rain and the topsoil, that surface layer is generally pretty loose, you'll get good surface seed to surface, soil surface contact. So once you prepare your site, then you need to design your seed mix or find a source of native plugs. So in a prairie planting, you should aim for a mix of about 60% forbs and 40% grasses slash graminoids, which just includes things that are like grasses, like sedges, for instance. So I would suggest avoiding, avoid using too much big blue stem, Indian grass, or switchgrass, because these grasses are all aggressive and can dominate a planting in the early years. In fact, at niches, they've gone to excluding these grasses completely from their seed mix mixes when they work on prairies. Instead, they favor Canada wild rye, prairie drop seed, little blue stem, and sedges such as Carex bicknellii. When you're designing your seed mix, you should plan for succession in your seed mix. Include a mix of early, mid, and late successional species. So what do I mean by this? So early successional species are those that we would consider weedy. They're good at colonizing disturbed areas, bare soil. So think about black-eyed Susans, brown-eyed Susans, and biennial guara. So they'll all grow readily in disturbed areas and they will bloom oftentimes in the first growing season. So mid-successional species are things like prairie coneflower and wild bergamot. And late successional species are species that you won't see for multiple years after you start your planting. So things like shooting stars, cream wild indigo, um, prairie drop seed, these are all late successional spirit species and they're characteristic of well-established prairies. So generally high quality natural areas. So another way that you, another way that you can get seeds is by going through the Indiana Native Plant Society, and they have a directory of where to buy local ecotype plants and seeds. And why do I say local ecotype? Because it's really important that you have plants that are adapted to the local area. If you're planting seeds that are not to this area, they don't have the same history encoded in their DNA. And so they're not really appropriate for the site and they won't form plant communities in the same way that local ecotype native plants will. But you can get no local ecotype native plants from the Tippecanoe Soil and Water Conservation Annual Plant Cell. I've used this a lot as a resource. And if they have any species that you don't see on their list, but you know they might have access to, if you order a whole flat, they'll be happy to do that for you. The Indiana Native Plant Society also has a plant sale, which I'm less familiar with, but I expect it is good. So you have your site planned, you have your site prepared, now it's time to plant your site. If you're directly seeding your site, you wanna broadcast your seeds in late fall or winter. If the area is flat, you can burn off the sod during the summer to improve seed to soil contact. If you have slopes, you don't wanna do this because that will open it up to erosion over the winter and can cause lots of problems. So you want to leave the sod in place if you have significant hills or differences in topography. One option for such an instance is to use seed drilling. So you can take and rent the seed drill from the NRCS and find somebody that can run it for you. <laughs> and then they can, it will split the sod, drop seeds in, and then put the sod back together and put them at an appropriate depth in the soil so that they'll germinate in the spring. If you don't plant most wildflowers in the fall, they won't grow because they need a period of cold moist stratification. So it's important to get them in, in the ground in the late fall or early winter before the growing season begins. So if you're gonna hand plant your garden with plant plugs, 
You want to place them about 9 to 12 inches apart. I generally err on the closer side together, so I measure mine about 9 inches apart, and I mulch them and water them. And I would recommend starting small because it's much easier to care for a small planting. You can always add more later, and I would suggest doing it in concentric, concentric circles. So do your initial planting and then build out in a circle around that the next year if you desire. So we have our site planted and we need to care for it in the first year because oftentimes in the first year, that's the most critical for your prairie planting to get established. So if you seeded it directly, you'll probably want to mow or string trim the area to reduce weedy competition because most prairie plants don't grow much in the first year. They mainly grow down into the soil and they only have a little bit of top growth so they're really susceptible to weedy competition from above. So you don't want to let those weeds get too tall and dense above them or they'll shade them out and kill all your prairie, prairie seedlings. And you don't want to hand weed your directly seeded planting in the first year because when you pull things out of the soil, you're disturbing roots and your little seedlings are really small. And so you're likely pulling up seedlings as you pull up the weeds. So it's just best to cut them off and let them compete. If you have a hand planting, you planted plugs into the ground, then hand pulling of weeds is perfectly fine because you know where your plants are. You can see them and they're going to be larger than the weeds. So hopefully. So that's short term ma maintenance. Generally in the first growing season, it's most critical. Oftentimes, depending on how weedy your planting is, you may need to have continued oversight into the next year. You may need to mow a few times. Long-term maintenance, if at all possible, prescribe burns during the dormant season. So the dormant season means when it's not actively growing. So in late fall, say in November or in early spring in March, you want to try to burn off the grass and the thatch every once in a while, every few years, say every one to five years, depending on your preferences. So as I mentioned before, prairies, savannas, and woodlands are all fire dependent. And in the absence of fire, they will become forest, which is less diverse and supports less wildlife and less species than these fire dependent community types. If burning's not possible, say you live in a residential neighborhood and burning just would not be allowed, you can potentially mow and rake to remove the thatch because the thatch that builds up from grasses can sometimes smother out smaller wildflowers. And if you mow and rake it, then you can remove the thatch and allow those wildflowers an opportunity to grow. But I would just remind you that it doesn't accomplish the same thing as burning. It's not exactly the same. And part of another part of longer term maintenance is to keep an eye out for invasive species. So you want to catch them early before they really gain a foothold in your planting. So one of the issues with using native plants is that people are afraid that it will look sloppy or unkempt. And these are some of the strategies that I've adopted to make my plantings look intentional. So the easiest way to make your planting look intentional is to mow a path through it. And it just makes it look like it was meant to be. And furthermore, it invites you to walk through it. So adding a bench or seating can be very useful and inviting and makes it look like you wanted people to be there. <laughs> so if you're going for a more formal border, um, you can add some edging material to your border. So we've used brick here next to our house because it's in keeping with style of our house, but you could use wood or plastic edging, whatever works best for you. Just something to make a definite edge to your planting. I've also taken to the use of repetition of elements. So I use grasses in a grid pattern. So this drop seed, the prairie drop seed sort of staggers back and forth in a grid pattern. And it's long lived, well behaved, and that grid pattern will stay there for 
a long, long time. So in a more formal setting, I would also use well-behaved plants because not all prairie species are well-behaved. <laughs> <laughs> Some like to seed, self-seed aggressively, aggressively. Others will spread via rhizomes under the ground. So spreading roots that will sprout. And you don't wanna use those in your formal planting because they'll tend to take it over. So well-behaved plants tend to be conservative species. And what I mean by conservative is that they're the ones that are the climax community of the prairie. So they are the first ones to disappear if there's any disturbance. And they're the last ones to reappear after a disturbance has ended. So, and they're also the best at playing nice in a community. So they're particularly well adapted to being in a community and they make for good neighbors. So some examples of conservative species that would grow in a prairie are prairie drop seed, cream wild indigo, lead plant, shooting stars. They're all species that take longer to mature, but they're well worth it because they do well in this kind of setting. And the final way that I'm going to mention here to make your planting look intentional is by having blooms going on the whole season. So this is a picture in the spring when I have my shooting stars and there's some prairie flocks. And prairie flocks is another conservative species. This is the same planting this time of year where you can see the purple prairie clover, the gray headed cone flowers. And then you see these guys waiting here in the wings and those are New England asters that are waiting till this fall to bloom. So it's always good to have something blooming because otherwise native plantings are not that showy <laughs> if there's nothing blooming. Another way to make your planting look intentional is, and this may be more undertaking that many people want, is to add a formal walkway. So this is an this is our pergola path. And over top, we have native vines, including bittersweet, um, the trumpet creeper, and a native wisteria. And down below along the edge of the path, we chose short species that would not flop over into the path and make it fairly welcoming and look well, well behaved. So we have shooting stars repeated along the posts, and then dwarf crested iris in between along the edges, and then some taller plants away from the path. So in general, you want to use short species near your trails. In this case, I didn't. It's just a more naturalized planting. And I use my machete to make sure it doesn't get too <laughs> tall and unwieldy. So that's, that's all I have. Those are my thoughts on gardening with native plant communities. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, wow, that was a lot of information. Great tips uh, that you shared. So yes, everyone here, if you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask away. Anyone? Probably like med school, like, <laughs> drink from a fire hose. The... <laughs> so, that's right. All right. Uh, any any comments, questions? I have a question. All right. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> House, because um, last year, taller than the windowsill. So it was just outstanding. So we added more this year. And um, so a couple weeks ago, we had a um, pretty heavy rain and wind. And so boom, they're all <laughs> spread out now. And they're tipped over. And um, we bought some posts so that we can try to pull them back up. But um, my daughter said, don't do that, mom, they're going to just break off. So we haven't tried it yet, but um, they just look kind of goofy. And um, I'm wondering what you would recommend. So 
I have, I think, a better long-term solution than I do a short-term solution. So I'll start with that. The long-term solution, the reason they flopped over is because there's a relative lack of competition. So you don't have that dense networks of roots right. and all those competitive forces going on. And when you do, then the plants can't get nearly so tall and they're much, much less prone to ever flop over. So if you take any of these prairie plants and put them in rich garden soil and keep the weeds away, in general, they'll get tall and flop over. But if in their communities out in nature, they have so much competition with their neighbors that they stay a relatively normal stature and you don't have that problem. For a short-term solution, I think if you're gentle, you can, you can prop them up if you want to. Most of them won't snap off. And even if they did, they'll still grow back. Right, okay. All right, we'll, we'll give it a try. We just kind of backed off. And <laughs> they're kind of just kind of meandering now a little bit, but um, they're starting to bloom. And um, so we may just give it a, a try. Then I, I thought another solution for next year could be to just put some, put the, the string out there first before they, you know, or when they're emerging. And so then when they get the height, when they're gonna crash over, um, that will be in place. So another strategy that you could use is to cut them back and that will promote bushier growth and lower growth and they'll be less likely to flop over when they bloom. But I want them to be up where I can see them from inside. Oh. Catch twenty-two. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, we have a question in the chat um, from Lori. She is just basically asking. She's afraid of doing a burn, and how would you make sure it doesn't get out of control? So, if you wanted to share a little bit how you do uh, burns um, on your property. Yeah. So I think it's really important to incorporate that in the planning, which I didn't really talk about. But you want to have good fire breaks around your plantings. And that's part of the function of the mowed trails, the paths that you mow through that makes burn units. And before I conduct a burn, one of the ways that I might extend that fire break is by mowing down the edge of the area that I plan to burn in the spring. So that will greatly reduce the height of the fire and it will make it much and in fact you can mow the whole area if you want to keep it a relatively tame air tame fire it's the standing vegetation and the standing grasses that really make that fire grow crazy and can make the sh flames go 20 feet 30 feet in the air so mowing it is one trick you always want to have fire breaks around it beforehand and you always wanna be cognizant of the conditions. The conditions of a burn are critical. So as the temperature increases, the relative humidity will decrease. And this happens naturally every day. And normally around midday or so, the winds get a little stronger than they were in the morning. So if you go to burning your fire breaks in the morning, say a little before lunchtime, and things are warming up while you're still burning your fire breaks and the wind picks up when you're burning your fire breaks, that is not a good situation. So you wanna burn your fire breaks when you know that the relative humidity is pretty high, probably around 50%. And it's probably better to do it in the evening because if you lose control in the evening, what's gonna happen? It's gonna cool down. The relative humidity is going to increase and the fire is probably going to go out by itself. So you have to use extreme caution and treat every fire with respect and just give it the potential. Think in your mind that it could become a wild wildfire uncontrolled. How, how am I going to prevent that? And that involves multiple layers of precautions and having adequate people on hand to deal with it as well. So you don't want to try to burn with just yourself. You want to have, and especially if it's your first burn, you want to have somebody there that's experienced with burning. It's not good to, it's not a thing that you want to learn out on the fly or figure out on the fly. It is not. 
we have another question in the chat from uh, Lori Markham. She is talking about uh, asking if there are any native plants that you know of that rabbits don't like because her neighborhood has a lot of hungry rabbits. Yeah, there, there are some. Well, and if you have a big enough habitat plot, you usually don't even notice the damage from rabbits. Like I rarely notice rabbit damage in my prairie plantings, but it's when you have things in isolation and well scattered and you keep a, <laughs> when it's not in a community that you really notice what you're missing. Um, so, I guess one answer to that is that the community will adapt and the ones, the species that are most palatable, palatable to rabbits will eventually disappear from the planting and you'll be left with the rest and it will look intentional anyways. So just roll with it. Um, certain legumes are particularly palatable. So lead plant is a hard one to establish when there's lots of rabbits or deer. Um, New Jersey tea is not a legume, but it is a nitrogen fixer, and animals find its vegetation particularly palatable. So those two would be ones to avoid. I know purple prairie clover is a legume, but it's apparently pretty deer resistant. I don't know about rabbit resistance. I don't have any firsthand experience. But a lot of the prairie plants have coarser leaves that the rabbits don't prefer. So things like compass plant and prairie dock, um, wild quinine, these are all species that have really coarse leaves. Cattle will eat them and bison will eat them, but rat rabbits generally leave them alone. Any, any other questions? It's looking beautiful, Kent. <laughs> well, thank you. I enjoyed and seeing all the flowers. I have talked to Mary about doing another Wednesdays in the Wild, yeah. especially since I've added another 22 acres of prairie. It's its first year this year, so it's looking quite weedy, but I've been mowing it and I can see recruitment of the little prairie species. Well, that would be wonderful. We would love to do that. <laughs> All right, another question from Sandra says, if you could recommend your top three natives for home gardens, what would they be? Top, which, how many? Th top three. Top three. Hmm. Just, th that's gonna be hard, isn't it? Just three. <laughs> Wild bird. A good one, I mean it. Very hard question. <laughs> I, I've been seeing a lot of things. I've been surprised on my purple coneflower. You know, some people poo poo purple coneflower, but <laughs> I've had a number of pollinators, even a wild bee that um, was on one. So, well, that's one thing to take into account is the adaptability of the plants. And purple coneflowers and pale purple coneflowers are both really beautiful for landscaping purposes, and they're hard to beat as far as just being tough and not dying easily. Mm -hmm. So I think those are three good recommendations that we came up with, Joan. Yeah, I've been enjoying my garden now because I go out there and water. I have a roadside garden too. It's not looking great, but it's, you know, the plants are moving along and, and it's just wonderful to see what comes to it. Even I've been having uh, monarchs show up and the tiger swallowtails and I'm, I'm just delighted. I mean, that's the fun of the plants is all the other stuff it brings in. It is. So. Yeah, and I didn't point out, but in my presentation, I got a picture of a 
garter snake trying to eat a toad that was right next to the prairie planting. There was no way that snake was going to eat that toad, but it was trying. Oh, wow. <laughs> I did see that. I did catch that. That's what that was a picture of. <laughs> oh, you, you really did. We, we could have seen that and we didn't. All right. Well, 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 you'll have to watch the recording and find it. And, <laughs> and look for it. Oh, he's going to take us back. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, it was earlier. It, it was a good, there it is. Huh. Oh, oh, yes. You should have pointed that out. <laughs> I, I just had too much to say. <laughs> uh, oh, my goodness. That frog looks pretty big compared to the little snake's mouth. <laughs> yeah. I would agree. Huh. So that's another thing that I didn't talk about too much um, during my talk, but there is so much wildlife associated with these plantings. I mean, so many insects, you just stand there and it buzzes, it's buzzing with life. Yeah. And then you stand and watch the birds and you'll see, say, a common yellow throat come out of the planting with a caterpillar in its beak and then go off to its nest. And I've had, I mean, so many species use these plantings. I commonly see snakes, especially in the spring, garter snakes and eastern fox snakes mm. are pretty common in my prairie. Okay, wonderful. Do you get tree frogs? Do you have cup plant? And do you ever see tree frogs in the cup plant? I have seen the adults on the cup plants. I've never seen them have lay eggs in the cup plants. Yeah, no, I haven't either, but I've seen the, yeah, the frogs. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's also amazing plants that disappear for a while, all of a sudden, uh, in fact, I used to have more cup plant and uh, I think I let too much go and now recently I saw, oh my gosh, I have a cup plant blooming and two other small ones nearby. So somehow they stay in the soil there until it's better for them. <laughs> it's the magic of the seed bank. <laughs> yes, I truly believe in that. Also, I don't know if you've heard of the book, Finding, Finding the Mother Tree by Suzanne Simard. She talks all about, it's really about the forests in the Pacific Northwest and the underground world of the mycorrhizal fungi. But, you know, she also talks about the, the possibility of that kind of communication going on even in herbaceous communities. And so I'm, I'm very, I don't like to pull things up anymore because I think I'm going to disturb this whole wonderful network. <laughs> But well, it's a wonderful book, so I, I enjoyed it. <clears throat> I've not read the book, but I have heard her research, and I think she inspired a whole article in National Geographic where they talked about the Pacific Northwest and the mycorrhizal associations, the fungi, and how they take carbohydrates from the plants and provide nutrients and water to the trees, and how they support little seedlings to help them grow so the next generation is there waiting, ready in the wings. I yeah. mean, it's really fascinating. It is amazing. And she did have an, uh, somebody wrote an article in the New York Times, I think in January about her work too. That was a, quite a nice article. Yeah. Well, I anyway, do... we like what you had to say. You had a lot of information. <laughs> I was trying to take notes. I don't think I kept up too well, but. <laughs> <laughs> any, other, any other lingering questions out there? Well, if there's no more questions, we are past the 730 mark. Um, just a reminder that everybody who registered for tonight's presentation will receive a link to the recording um, and just over the next few days. So you can rewatch and catch all those notes um, and little tidbits you may have missed the first go around. So, um, but on behalf of everyone, thank you so much, Kent, for sharing your knowledge uh, with all of us tonight. And yeah. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. So. And look My for pleasure. his program in Wednesdays in the Wild. We'll have to get him <laughs> out there next spring, maybe, or summer, whenever is good. 
sounds Probably wonderful. Next summer. <laughs> sounds okay. great. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good night. All right. Thanks. Thanks.